Well, here we are. This is Military Images Live, coming to you from Arlington, Virginia. Military Images is a magazine that uh, has been around since 1979, and our subject is Civil War era portrait photography. We've been doing the magazine uh, in recent years as a quarterly, and uh, while we are waiting for folks to come on this evening, I'll talk a little bit uh, about some of the exciting upcoming events that we have going on. I see Fred is here, Michael is here, Kevin is here. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. It's a sort of a sultry early summer evening here in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, but we're going to be heading up to Chicago in just a few weeks. I don't know what the weather there will be, um, but today we hit 80 degrees here in Arlington. So I've got this poster right here for you to take a look at. This is the Wheaton Show uh, held in uh, the suburban Chicago area twice a year, uh, in April and again in September. Uh, Military Images attends one of these shows each year, and this year we thought we'd do the spring show. So if you are in the Chicago area on April 27th, that's just in a few weeks, about three weeks from today, stop in, say hello, I'll be there at the MI table, and uh, we'll talk about old photos, we'll scan your photos, and uh, of course, you'll get to do plenty of shopping. Getting plenty of emojis by folks coming on. Jim is here. Uh, Rick is here. Steve is here. More folks coming on. Thank you all so much for being part of the program. Thanks for the smiley faces, the hearts, and all the other good emoji thoughts. So how should we start this evening? I want to talk about uh, what I think is maybe one of the, one of the more misunderstood aspects of Civil War photography, and this is the photographers, specifically those photographers who are leaving their home studios, leaving their hometowns, making their way uh, by wagon uh, across sometimes uh, some hostile and forbidding terrain to take photos of uh, soldiers. And so it brings to mind some of these great images that we published, uh, I believe it was last year, in the magazine. This great image, it says, Headquarters for Photographs. We've got another wonderful image uh, of a makeshift studio made up uh, in a wood building with some canvas spread over the top. You've got some soldiers. I got to point these guys out. They're leaning over the side. They've got their arms over the side of the building. A little photographer sign up in the corner. Uh, then you've got this classic winter quarters. You can see the logs uh, and all the reinforcements going on. You can see the photographer sign right there. And last but not least, we've got this great image, maybe one of the better known images of uh, Morse's, uh, Algernon Morse uh, photographer. This is his fancy tent. So the new information comes from Craig McNutt. Uh, those of you who know Craig may be familiar with his Facebook page, uh, which is called Grapevine Dispatches. There's a lot of great news that comes through there. So I urge you, if you don't follow Craig uh, and Grapevine Dispatches, I recommend signing up for it. Great site, lots of great information. Uh, his current post is about uh, Civil War movies. Uh, so check that out. Anyway, uh, Craig contacted me last week. He was having uh, some challenges transcribing a letter. And I thought, well, uh, let, me, let me take a look at it and see what I can do. And between the two of us, we transcribed a letter. It was written by William C. Olds, uh, and he served in the 63rd Indiana Infantry. Now, William had an opportunity to get into the family business that was run by his father, Frank. Uh, William wasn't, wasn't particularly interested in the family business, but he wanted to help out his dad. Uh, that family business, by the way, was a photography studio. And this letter that uh, young William wrote 
from Bulls Gap, Tennessee on April 21st, 1864, tells us a couple really interesting things about these photographers uh, who made the trek down to the, uh, uh, the camps to take photographs of all these men. So I'm gonna read this whole thing to you because I think it's great. And it starts out just like you expect. It says, Dear Father, as I had not heard from you for some time and got tired of waiting for an answer from my last letter, I thought I would write you again. A fairly common start. Since I last wrote you, I have found out that there are four picture galleries with this core. Two of them is owned by some Eastern men, one by Morse, the man you work for, and one by Charlie Perry, the man with, I, with whom I have worked while he was down here. So we just learned that uh, Morse's gallery uh, and Morse and, and William Olds's father, Frank, worked together for a time. We also learned that William worked for a photographer named Charlie Perry. Now, Charlie Perry is still in camp at Bulls Gap, Tennessee, taking pictures. And Perry says, uh, according to William, Perry told me today that he had more work than he could do. He also said he took in $133 today. Now, that means that Charlie, the photographer, made $133 on one day. If you put that in terms of $2,019, it's equivalent to $2,141. So Charlie, the photographer, had basically a $2,000 day. And there's more. One day this week, he took in $225. That's the equivalent of $3,600. So old Charlie was on a lot of photos. He also says, there is a fellow along with him by the name of Orleans. Him and his partners own two tents. One is at Knoxville and the other one here. Morse's tent, that's this one, is at Mossy Creek. The Eastern men only got ordered here and they are also at Mossy Creek. Perry fetched his goods across the mountains but he tells me goods could not be got over the railroads at present. Our officers tried to get Perry to take some photographs for them. Listen to this. Perry takes positives here and sends them to his room at Reedville, where the negatives are taken from there. So, big, big piece of information here. Uh, the photographer is making the negatives in the camp, uh, in this case in Tennessee, and then those negatives are going back with him to his home studio, which is in Indiana. They're being developed there, the prints are being made there, and then presumably delivered back to the soldiers. Now that's an interesting detail. Uh, for those of you who uh, uh, have an idea that the photographs were actually developed on site, many I'm sure probably were. But here's an instance where only the images, only the negative was made, and they were printed later on. So uh, William continues writing to his father, if you come down to this department and come prepared to take photographs, I think you can take a great many of them. Perry's tent, here's another bit of information. If you wonder how much these tents costs, William is about to tell us. Perry's tent cost him $186 with the dark room in Cincinnati. That's about $3,000 or one good day of work. He told me that he intended to go home in a few days and intends to take his tent to Reedville with him. I asked him what he would take for the whole thing. Now we're talking about the tent, the apparatus, all the uh, materials. Um, and he says five or $600. Now that's some pretty good money. Uh, this photographer, Charlie, is willing to sell his entire studio for about $600. That is about $10,000 in today's money. That includes all the stock, but Charlie does not care to sell out at present. So Charlie the photographer knows a gravy train when he sees it. Uh, he goes on, if he comes to Indianapolis, you may buy out one of his tents. I think the best thing you can do is come out with the army this summer. He goes on to talk about the brigade. He goes on to talk about 
uh, his family and asks to write as soon as he can. So this letter is one of the more consequential letters that I've heard about and helped transcribe in this case about photographers, specifically those photographers who are going out on the road to take photos. So a lot of information about tents, about how much it costs, and about how much they can make. So a great, great bit of information and uh, new to me, and I hope new to you as well. If you have uh, come across letters that have similar information, I would love to know about it uh, because there's a lot of scholarship to be done around these images, and a lot of this information is completely unknown. So, speaking of letters, I came across another letter that uh, ties into pipes, and I wanted to show this image. We published it recently in the magazine of uh, five union men, oh, pardon me, six union men, with uh, cigars and pipes. And uh, it connects with a letter that uh, I transcribed very recently uh, from a Navy man. And uh, it's a Navy officer who was uh, down in Savannah, Georgia, in Oglethorpe Barracks. He was a Union man, and he was captured on the gunboat Water Witch on June 3rd, 1864. And those of you who know the story of the Water Witch know that uh, a crew of about 130 Confederate sailors sailed away, um, steamed away from the defenses of Savannah on this June day in 1864. They surprised the crew of the boat and uh, they took the 77 men on board prisoners. One of those men was acting master Charles Buck uh, and he was imprisoned. And when he got to Oglethorpe Barracks, which is an old military post that was built in Savannah back around the 1830s, I believe, uh, he got there, uh, the other prisoners got there, and what they encountered was, among other things, a serious problem with flies. Now, here's where the pipe comes in, and here's where this quote comes in. It says, tonight, Mr. Buck, and this is coming from a transcribed letter. It says, tonight, Mr. Buck got a pipe and will try to smoke the flies away, which are very plenty. Now, this may seem simple, uh, and on some level it is, but for those of us who read many references to the enjoyment of pipe smoking, the enjoyment of tobacco, here's an example where it's being used for more practical reasons. Uh, simply, this Navy man is trying to rid the barracks of flies. And the idea here is that the tobacco smoke uh, is going to clear the flies. Did it work? We don't know. Uh, but uh, it makes me tempted to try. Uh, I don't really want to get into uh, a barracks with a bunch of flies, but it could be a good experiment. So. For those of you who are reenactors, uh, the next time you're in a fly infested area, light up your pipe, see what happens, and let me know. Now, here in Virginia, some uh, civil, civil war things are always happening in this neck of the woods. And uh, this weekend, I had an opportunity, a chance opportunity, to meet uh, a woman who uh, is descended from this man. You may know this image. There are several copies of it that are out there. And before you even know who he is, you know that there is a difficult story behind this. He's a Confederate officer, we can tell by his coat. He has a pair of crutches, very prominently displayed. And you can see there is a tear in his coat and the chest and there's some dark staining that's going on. Also up here, you can see his face. It's very thin, it's very sallow. His eyes are sunken back. Now, those of you who know who this man is, perhaps know his story. He's a, a Charlie, Charles, but he went by Charlie Minigar Road. And I met, as I mentioned, I met one of his, um, uh, one of his descendants this weekend, and we talked about Charlie. And uh, the descendant 
knows his story very well. Uh, about 15 years old when the war began, he worked in Richmond Arsenal for a while and uh, always wanted to be a soldier, wanted to be an officer. So he became an officer and um, uh, he eventually joined the staff of Fitzhugh Lee. Now, his father wasn't particularly fond of such a young man, his son, who joining the army. Charlie Minigrode's father was Charles Minigrode Sr., who headed up to church where Jefferson Davis worshiped. So his son, Charlie, went into the war, uh, served on the staff of Fitzhugh Lee, and survived without a scratch, maybe three, three and a half years in uniform. That is, until April 9th of 1865, which is 154 years tomorrow. Now, I met the descendant, a wonderful lady, on Saturday, and um, we remarked on how a, what a coincidence it would be for us two to meet and both of us to be talking about Charlie just a few days before that day on April 9th, 1865, when uh, with Fitzhugh Lee, he was out in front of the army as the Union army was coming on. A bullet found him, hit him in the chest. That explains the wound right here. And he was writhing in agony. He fell on the ground. The Union soldiers were coming up fast. Fitzhugh Lee didn't really have time to stop. And so the story goes, the surgeon that was there with Lee's staff wrote Charlie's name on a piece of paper, pinned it to his jacket, maybe this jacket, I suppose, while he was laying on the ground, writhing in pain, and they rode away. The staff had tears in their eyes, so it was said, because Charlie was a favorite, young man, one of the favorites of the staff. Union soldiers came upon him, took him prisoner, only for a short time, and they treated him. Miraculously, he recovered. You might have figured that out because here he's posed in the jacket in which he was shot and the crutches, uh, still hard for him to walk at this time, probably by the end of 1865. So Charlie goes on to live in Alexandria, Virginia, has a little stint down in New Orleans, trying to make money as a businessman. Uh, all the time he's carrying the bullet that hit him in the chest in his pocket. It was his talisman. He carried that bullet with him day in and day out, as I understand, mostly in his vest pocket. But the failures of business, challenges on his, with his life, with his family, and perhaps some of his issues left over from that April day in 1865 caused him about 20 years after the war to put the muzzle of a revolver against his temple and pull the trigger. He was gone at 42. And in his pocket, they found that bullet that he had carried with him since his wounding. So I felt honored to meet one of his family members and both of us had quite a moment as we were talking about Charlie. You may have seen this photo on eBay. I believe it came up last week for sale. A very old gentleman. At the top of the photo, it says, uh, Father Waldo, born September 10th, 1762. That's not a mistake, 1762. Here's another photo of Daniel Waldo. He was a veteran of the Revolutionary War, and he has a tie-in to the Civil War. Oh, one of the things that was said about him is uh, he voted for George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. 1861, as the uh, presidential train was coming from Springfield to take the president-elect to Washington, one of the stops was in Syracuse. Daniel Waldo was on the platform that day waiting for Lincoln to come out and make some remarks. Lincoln decided against making remarks. Uh, 
uh, on the platform, he said a few things from the train. And uh, uh, folks really wanted Daniel Waldo to meet the president. So they literally lifted him up off the platform. He was a tiny uh, doddering old man by that time, uh, close to 100. They lifted him off the platform and uh, had him shake the president's hand. Now, that's a great anecdote. But what he's really known for, we have to go back about six years earlier. The Congress uh, at that time, around 1855, was about as polarized as it could be around the issue of slavery. So polarized were they that they had trouble making, uh, passing any legislation. One piece of legislation they did pass is they decided that they were going to suspend the post of chaplain of the House of Representatives. Instead, they were going to replace it with visiting ministers who could say the um, opening prayer while Congress was in session and um, then be on their way. Well, uh, they had some issues. Some folks liked that idea, some didn't. The speaker, newly elected speaker, uh, a man named Nathaniel P. Banks, the bobbin boy, who uh, many of you know from his exploits during the war as a political general, he, um, uh, he and others were thinking, well, we should probably bring back the idea of the chaplaincy. So uh, they struggled to come to a decision to find a compromise candidate because all the candidates they put in front of the Congress were either too far one way or too far the other way. So eventually someone brought up the name of Daniel Waldo who at the time was 94, and uh, uh, he was approved. There was a lot of concerns about Daniel. They said, uh, one man said of him, when a man has reached the 94th year of his age, it would not be regarded as a very unjust opinion were we to assume that his day for preparing original discourses to be delivered with the clear and distinct enunciation which is necessary to convey what he would utter to the hearing of an audience seated in different parts of the great hall of the Capitol had gone by. Untrue. He took his place. Some folks said he doesn't seem to be a day over 70, had a good clear voice and uh, made a wonderful speaker. Goes on, civil war happens. And one of the things that he says is that uh, he's a big supporter of the union and he says he wants to live to see the union come back to, together again. He, of course, doesn't make that. He dies on July 30th, 1864, just shy of his 102nd birthday. So, one other detail I'll tell you. When I was researching Daniel Waldo's life a few years ago, I went to the list, the official list of chaplains of the U.S. House of Representatives. Remember that little detail I told you earlier where the congressional session started off with um, visiting ministers, they had abolished the chaplaincy. Well, because of that technicality, Daniel Waldo, Revolutionary War veteran, uh, chaplain of the house, was not listed. So I wrote some letters, contacted some people, some years went by. I went to the site to check it, to see how the list was faring, and to see if my good friend, Father Waldo, was finally added. And guess what? He's on the list. So cheers to Daniel Waldo, Father Waldo. There he is. Some of you may know that Military Images has a, a relationship with many of the magazines, the general interest Civil War magazines. Uh, we do a feature for the Civil War Monitor called Faces of War. If you like coincidences, this is a good one. In the most recent issue is uh, the Faces of War column. It's called Charlie's Legacy. Those of you saw it on Facebook a couple months back know that this man, Charlie Gloyd, 
was an Ohio officer who fell in love with a young woman, uh, was plagued by alcohol after the war, died very young. His young wife uh, vowed to go on and to fight for temperance, to fight against the evils of alcohol. That woman, Carrie is her name, later remarried a man named David Nation. So the legend of Carrie Nation is related to her first husband, Charles Lloyd. Soon after this came out, I received an email from a gentleman named Chris Jarvis. Chris subscribes to the magazine. He saw the image of Charles Lloyd happened to be on eBay that day and saw this photo. Unidentified, but unmistakably, Charlie Gloyd, another image of Charlie. He alerted my attention to it, and it's no longer on eBay. Can tell you, we put it on Civil War Photo Sleuth to do a test, uh, just to try out the face recognition tool. And uh, lo and behold, the first result that came up when we put the images uh, was the new image of Charlie Gloyd. So now we have two portraits of Charles Gloyd, who previously was uh, unknown, except for, I believe, a, a post-war image. So here's Charles Gloyd, the inspiration to Carry Nation. Speaking of covers, I've got one more for you. This is our recent cover, uh, Fighting for Freedom. Image from the, uh, at the time was with the Doug York collection. And uh, this young man was found in uh, Massachusetts, possibly a member of the 54th or the 55th Massachusetts. A young woman named Lisa Burroughs saw this magazine cover and uh, became interested. She ordered a copy and she called me. She lives in Ashtabula, Ohio, and uh, she works at a, um, uh, at, a, at a museum called the Hubbard House Museum. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Lisa and I talked and got on a subject that is important to me. That's about sharing information about these soldiers and bringing that information to different audiences part of our history. We have a responsibility, in my opinion, to understand where we came from so that we can know where we're going. So Lisa and I talked, uh, and together we came up with what I think is an interesting idea. The idea is this. For all Americans out there, not everybody can subscribe to a magazine. Not everybody can come to Washington, D.C or travel to one of the battlefields to get to see a little bit of Civil War history. So why not bring it to them? Let's bring the history out to folks around the country. So here's what we're gonna do. We have 20 images of African Americans. Some of them, I've got permission from you, some of you who may be watching tonight. We're gonna take these 20 images, we're gonna make copies of them, we're gonna frame them, and we're gonna bring them to Ashtabula. It's gonna be the first in a traveling show we're gonna do. Each of the images is identified, we'll have a story about the image, and we're gonna share it, we're gonna get the word out there. We're gonna do this in June, so uh, a couple months away. I'm really excited about it. Uh, part of the mission of military images to bring photography, bring history, and bring stories of men, of women, and others who participated in the war. So if you live in Ashtabula, around that area, stay tuned for information. I actually have a, a poster that uh, has just been approved. This is the official show poster. And um, uh, I hope you'll make it to the show. Anyway, if you don't, I hope to see you in Chicago. And if you're not in Chicago, I'll be in Mansfield. 
you're not in Mansfield, I'll see you here on the next episode of Military Images Live. Thanks so much for participating this evening. Stay in touch. Send me an email. Take care.